since recording. What's it that for? I don't know. Oh. Oh, <laughs> I, remember, I remember that we used that for like a little thing. We did it for uh, the news crew. That's right. <laughs> I might use it today. Right. For anybody who falls asleep. This is like there's three judges. <laughs> This is American yeah. Idol right here. Except That's for, right. You're going to perform. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, first of all, thank you all for being here. Uh, this is a really cool subject, and we have a really cool panel. So let me introduce the people on the panel. So the gentleman immediately to my right is Roger Quillen. And Roger was pastor at Northridge from 1977 to November of 2009. 32 years, longest pastorate in uh, the history of Northridge. And I've heard Roger preach on this subject before, and he just does a beautiful job. And then about 15 years ago, uh, when I was teaching youth Sunday school, Roger came in on this subject and, and just was really, really helpful on the subject. So I, I was thrilled when he said that he'd help us today. In the middle, you know Andrew, right? So who can tell me where Andrew grew up? Not everyone that I'm seeing in front of me was here the last time I was yeah. in the hot seat, but. All right, so. Andrew, is, Andrew is the product of affirmative action in that he's from Arkansas, <laughs> all right? Oh, wow. And. What channel? Facebook. Facebook. Yeah. You familiar? Oh, yeah. Oh, gosh. Okay. Yeah. All right, yeah. so Andrew grew up in Arkansas. How, how many know the story of how he, he and Emily met? Anyone? Bueller? Anyone? <laughs> they met at Mo Ranch. Is that right? That's right. And uh, and you were there, Andrew? We met once when I was going into seventh grade, and I didn't like girls then. I liked video games. And uh, she remembers me, though. I was really annoying. <laughs> and then we met two years later. And she said I'd grown about six inches, and that's when we really hit it off. <laughs> All right. And then Andrew went to Baylor for his master's degree, but Andrew, what was your major at Arkansas? Biology. Biology. Yeah. And then what was your master's in at Baylor? Molecular biology. And what is your PhD at, it's at UT Southwestern? Mm -hmm. And it is? It's cell and molecular biology. Cellular and molecular biology. Biology. So would it be sure. fair to describe you as a scientist? Absolutely. Okay. And the right Reverend Betsy Lyles Sweetenberg. Um, and Betsy, you went to Davidson undergrad, mm -hmm. and your major was? English. English. And did you ever take a science class in college? Mm -hmm. We were required to. So you yeah. took? I took? I took the physics of everything. like. You know, how does the DVD spin and the DVD player, just kind of the world around you, all the math and the physics that are happening. And then um, I took the chemistry of art and artifacts. Um, and we got to, like, what professors would bring back from their digs. All right. And at seminary at Columbia, did, did, did any of your training include wrestling with our topic? Yes, not like explicitly, not like science and religion class, but um, you can't not think about it, I think. Okay. Yeah, lots of questions. All right, so that's our panel, and you all have questions, and it uh, looks like uh, Linda didn't get them all, the, all distributed, but. Okay. Uh, right? Yes, what's left? Okay. What do you think? All right. All right. So I'll fill in those gaps, uh, or Linda, Linda will. Okay. <laughs> Linda and Sarah will. Are these just yes to numbers? Yes. Okay. They have numbers on them? Yeah. yeah. All right. And everybody's got one? Yeah. I got it. Okay. Even those All right, who's got question one? And speak up. It's me. So we can hear. All right, as a child in Sunday school, what were you taught about creation? So you're having to think back to your childhood. And I'm getting a lot of scrunchy faces <laughs> on the 
the panel. I don't remember the uh, subject ever coming up in Sunday school, and that was in the 1940s and 50s. And I think the churches then were still pretty uh, nervous about opening up this topic. Well, Andrew, Arkansas, mm -hmm. the home of the Enlightenment. Um, yeah, that's our motto. <laughs> what, were, what were you taught about creation in yeah. Sunday school? I mean, yeah. you know, what everyone I think heard from Bible class, Genesis, right? God created the world in a week, took a day off, one or two days. That was about the extent of it. Did they even, what were your science classes? You, you studied biology at Baylor. Mm -hmm. What science? Oh, yeah. I mean, I got to University of Arkansas and heard totally different stories about how the world came to be and how old it is and how people came to be. So that would pertain to what you had on the board there. So I learned more on the right at college and more on the left in Sunday school. And did your high school classes at all touch on this? If, if they did, it was not memorable at all. I don't remember that. All right, what, what are you all getting in school now? Do you discuss the Big Bang Theory and do you just discuss evolution or do the schools stay away from it? Well, kind of did, like, last week, I mean, we talked about, like, how, how all the school systems around us are slowly getting further apart. Like, like, yeah, it's not So it was it was talked about in, in school. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? No. Okay. How many have heard of it before? Mm -hmm. What Big Bang? Yeah. Just I'm curious. Like, how many have heard? Yeah. Oh, I'm trying to reach it. Yeah. yeah. Honestly, uh, I've heard about it. Never learned it because we were only learning biology and just like those. Okay. All right. Mike, if the young folks are uh, comfortable doing this, if they could take off their mask, I sure could hear them better. Is that all right? Yeah, if you're speaking. If I you think feel uh, safe enough to do that. Well, they can take it off when they speak. And that if, would be helpful. Well, that would help, yeah. Take it off when you're speaking. Okay. Uh, question two, I believe. I have it. You basically asked it. In high school <laughs> science class, what were you taught about the origins of the universe? Prior to science class. No, in high school. In high school. In high school science mm -hmm. class. What have you taught about the origins of the universe? I didn't have a specific class. It was just kind of a. I don't even know if it was intentionally avoided, but you take physics or chemistry, and um, you just kind of go. You choose your path, and, um, so I didn't. I don't know. It just wasn't really taught. I mean, it was maybe a, like, it was one, I don't know, chunk of class, but I don't feel like it was that long, and um, I think in part because it's still, it puts people on edge. Like, you always, as soon as it comes up, like, someone will begin debating the teacher, and I definitely um, had some classmates who, it was hard for them to hear about evolution, and go to church on Sundays. They couldn't fit it together. But it wasn't really the teacher's job to fit it together. So the best uh, thing to do was to avoid it, I think, or to get through as fast as you could. Um, that stinks, because then people just go further and further into their corner. So there, I never saw a good conversation. Um, I don't know, what about yours? I vaguely recall something like evolution being talked about in my high school biology class, um, but that was the extent that either of those topics were discussed in my schooling. And then I remember talking about it a lot with my friends. We were just mm. very curious about what we knew and wanted to talk about those things. I, I remember discussing that a lot in high school. So. Okay, I'm gonna uh, go to question three and then I'm gonna pose a question to the panel. So. 
So Sarah, you've got question three. Before you went away to college, did you ever have a discussion with your parents about Genesis and science? Or two, if so, what were you told? I sort of know that Andrew had a little bit of a discussion. Yeah, I remember before going away to college, um, talking with my parents, and they kind of gave me some advice, you could call it. They just said, remember what you've been taught, keep an open mind, but you know, don't forget whose you are and who you are, which meant to me, um, don't, don't let the uh, liberal college brainwash you. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. And for context, your dad was a Presbyterian minister. And the liberal college was the University of Arkansas. Yeah. <laughs> Just very liberal college. <laughs> What's your family name? Cox. You went to Boston Theological Presbyterian Seminary. Okay. Betsy, did you do you have this conversation in the Lyles household? Well, um, yeah, but I, I mean, I shared some of y'all. I grew up in a college town, so my Sunday school teachers were also professors. And so it was never, it was just never a question that it was one or the other. It was, you know, there were science professors teaching Sunday school, so it never seemed like either or, just by virtue of them showing up on Sunday morning. So in my house, it wasn't a... Um, it never felt like either or. It was never black and white. It was, we have both things, and um, if God made all of us, God made scientists. So, <laughs> of course, um, there's something to be learned, and, but you don't, you don't have to pick a camp. So, I feel like my church was just more open, and um, it didn't feel as drastic. I'm going to ask Roger to... Sort of provide context for this discussion. So, Roger, can you talk to us a little bit about just when scripture came into being versus when science came into being? Um, well, let me say too with the last question that um, neither of my parents went to college. And um, my going to college made them proud, but it also scared them because they knew I was going to be exposed to things that were um, not on their radar screen. And I remember my dad one time while I was in college telling me that I was, uh, uh, that I thought I was smart, but I was being a smart aleck. And I think it was around the fact that he felt threatened by things I was telling them that I was learning in college. But nowadays, almost everybody's parents have been to college. So when you go, that probably won't be a factor. Um, the Bible was written. All of the Old Testament was written and settled before Jesus came along. And most of the New Testament, probably all of the New Testament, was written after Jesus in the first 100 to 150 years in response to Jesus. So from that period on, the Roman Catholic Church was the only church there was, and they had this worldview which was not at all scientific. It's what's been called a the view of the world as a three-story universe, that God was up here, and the earth, which was flat, was here with people on it, and down here was hell. So there were three stories of the universe. And I remember hearing that growing up as though it were uh, a fact. 
but around about the 15th and 16th centuries, still some five or 600 years before now, there began to be a scientific revolution uh, that started in um, Europe. It was especially prominent among some people in Italy, which is kind of ironic because that's where the seat of the Roman church is. And a man named Galileo, who was a, 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 a Christian and a strong believer, nevertheless was a scientist. And so the things he kept discovering and writing about, talking about, uh, were uh, the church didn't like that. And more than once the church accused him of heresy. He even spent time in a prison for heresy. Do you know that term, heresy? means that his teachings, the church determined or judged, had a trial and determined that his teachings were outside the bounds of what was true as far as the church was concerned. Teachings about the world, about the earth, the sky, and so on. So Galileo has a famous saying that the Bible shows us the way to go to heaven and science shows us how the heavens go. He already had a sense that the uh, earth was not the center of the universe. He had some sense that uh, planets and stars were moving not around the earth, but the earth was moving around in the, in the cosmos also, around the sun, around the moon, and so on. And, uh, and he got put in prison for thinking that way. And today, we just take that for granted. And then when Charles Darwin came along, do you know his name? He uh, wrote the book about evolution. Uh, that was in the 19, late 19th century. And he, um, he wrote this book based on his observations and his findings about evolution and how man came to be, man evolved, as Mike has written up here. Um, but he didn't publish it because he knew it was upset his wife, who was a true believer and believed the very fundamental stuff that the church had always taught. And then toward the end of his life, he learned that one of his uh, colleagues, who was also a competitor, was about to publish his book on evolution. <laughs> and so Darwin got busy and published his book. And then he and his wife had to struggle between them over that. But he too was was uh, was challenged by the church with those teachings. And then in the 20th century, in, in, in the 1920s, it was against the law in the United States to teach evolution. And there was a famous case in the state of Tennessee where a high school biology teacher named John Scopes began to teach his students about evolution. And of course, kids went home and told their parents and everybody got in a big uproar about it. And there was a, a, a trial and he was found guilty and was not allowed to teach anymore because those schools in that area at that time were not prepared to hear that and they didn't want their students hearing that. But since the 1920s in this country, uh, it's opened up and we I don't know of a school district anywhere that still challenges that kind of teaching maybe you all do but, uh, that's a little bit of history of uh, how the scientific understanding of the world gradually over hundreds of years uh, began to take precedent over the old religious understanding as being the center of the universe.
right, we got two ministers on the panel. Here's my study Bible. Mm -hmm. Okay, you want me to read it, right? Yep. You want me to study it. Yep. You want me to try to discern its meaning, right? Mm -hmm. And we think it's the inspired word, the inspired revelation of God. Right? We good so far? All right. So if it's inspired word of God, why can't we believe that Genesis is literally true? Well, you See, I had, I'm the lawyer. I ask the tough questions, and then they have to give the answers. <laughs> Feels like a setup. You can believe that if you want to. I remember growing up hearing that uh, uh, people were, were trying to come to terms with that story in Genesis and saying, well, when it says God created something on the first day, it doesn't mean a 24-hour day. Uh -huh. It means maybe, well, I was beginning to hear maybe a thousand years, which began to take account of the idea of evolution, that, it un that the creation unfolded slowly. And, that, and we now know over millions of years it unfolded slowly. Uh, so that's one way to get around. Another way is that, uh, well, I lost my train of thought. I'll jump back in. Go ahead. Well, how many of you, are you all in science class right now? Uh, and what are you, okay, so I hear you talk about um, I'm in the solar system. Okay, and what do you do? Do you um, make a model or? Are you studying cell structure or something? Uh, yes. Okay, so you're getting into the nitty gritty because that's what science does, right? You, you take these things that look, you know, a leaf um, that might look simple and then you put it under a microscope and you start taking it apart and seeing all these little cells. You take a solar system and you start pulling it apart, right? That's what science does. They try to, try to pull things apart to figure out um, how things work. But that's not really what religion does. Um, religion tries to put things together to see what they mean. Um, so what Genesis is doing and what the Big Bang Theory are doing are, are very different things. The Big Bang is trying to pull apart what we know about the world and say, how did this happen? But what Genesis is doing is um, saying, what does it mean that God created this world? How should we live because of that? Um, so they're just doing different things. And I think, um, you know, to do science, you have to look at the world as it is. And so you have to look at history. Um, but to do religion, you're looking at the world as it should be. It's motivated by the future. And so I think they're coming at the world from two different places. Um, so they really need each other. Because um, you can do science, um, and you need all the, the past. Um, but science should ask, what does it mean? What does it mean for the future that we just made this cool discovery? Like Andrew's doing stuff that will change the world, um, but he needs to ask the next question. Like, what does this mean for the people who will come after me? And that's what religion does. Um, so I think they have to talk to each other. Andrew, you confronted this a little bit at Baylor. Sure. Uh, when you got to your master's program, tell us about the conversations you had. So one thing, while I was at Baylor, y'all are familiar with Baylor University, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Baptist. Go Bears, uh, yeah, right? Go, yeah, Sick go Bears. <laughs> Bears, yeah, Sick em. They're a Baptist uh, associated university, so that means they um, they teach religion in their curriculum. A lot of people that go there go because they feel it's a place that it's safe to be religious in, in a university institution. Um, which, as you heard from Roger, isn't there? There was a divide earlier in the in the 1900s that happened. Anyway, when I was there, I 
met with a bunch of professors and other graduate students who we would talk about things like this. We would have these kind of discussions over lunch. And, and one of them uh, was about how to reconcile um, the, the Bible and the scripture that we have been given and then also scientific thinking. And one thing I want to pass on to y'all that might that's helped me, might help y'all, is I, similar to how Betsy said, I've looked at the word that's been written in the Bible was written before science was a thing. It was a way of making sense of the world before we had the tool of science. And so it, it is inspired word of God and it is meant to help us construct um, how, we, how we are to live. But that doesn't negate what we see from our scientific experiments. Did you encounter uh, Andrew professors who were people of faith? Absolutely. Yeah. I'd say it is a requisite that any professor that works at Baylor be very open with their faith. In fact, I saw many candidates turned away because they weren't convinced that they were religious enough to be faculty at Baylor. So I'd say everyone, every professor I met was more than willing to have a discussion about how they integrated their science with their spirituality. Was any professor teaching creationism? No, but there were departments that um, were very much not happy with the age of the universe and evolution being thought. Yeah, and the, that was a schism that is actually, I'd say, still present at Baylor. But they want to be an R1 research institution, so they are very much hiring professors that in the sciences that inf inform their worldview from a scientific viewpoint. But I would say not every professor there shares that. I have to say, a word of clarification for Baylor, where I also went many years before Andrew. Um, there, all the professors are not Baptist. Right. They, they, uh, but they would all profess a faith, and it might be a different. There, I knew Catholic professors. I knew Jewish professors. Right. Not many, but just wanted to put that out there. Not everybody's Baptist. Yeah. It was a cool place to be because it it showed me a uh, template, I guess, a way of doing science while still being open about your religion. And, and that's something that you all might experience when you go off to college is that a lot of college attitude toward religion is, well, that's kind of backwards thinking, mm -hmm. right? And Baylor was a place for me where I was able to talk about both of those things and not feel um, like I was going to be ostracized for talking about both of those aspects of my life. That's good to hear. Who's got question five? Mask, please. Uh, yes. Sorry. Uh, if Genesis, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If Genesis is not a uh, science, why should we pay attention to it? Mm -hmm. If Genesis is not science, why should we pay attention to it? I had a um, seminary classmate who, um, that's where you go to learn how to be a pastor. Um, and we were in an Old Testament class and every time it was time to do a project, he wanted to do a project on why something was true, like why the creation story is true, um, how do we know that bread really rained down from heaven, um, how do we know that uh, you know, the snake talked to Moses when, when the staff turned into, you know, he just was so fixated. It was really annoying. You know people in your classes who they always bring up the same point every time he did that and it got old really fast and um one day my professor thank goodness told the story of there's this famous uh theologian carl bart and he was giving a lecture and a woman came to the lecture and said you mean to tell me for someone as smart as you you believe that a snake can really talk um and he said i don't care if the snake could talk I care what the snake, the snake said. Um, and I think if you look at the Bible, if you try to read the Bible and think, is this really true? Um, you miss the point. Because there's so much about human nature in there, about how we're supposed to live. Um, and you just, you can waste a whole life trying to figure out if it really happened or not. Um, but that's not the point. So I think the point is, uh, what truth is there about how we're to live? what God desires for us. And that's beautiful in the creation story. 
Uh, there's a lot in crea we need the creation story to learn about what a rhythm of life looks like. It's important that God rests it. Um, right? It's it's important that it's all creation. It's not just humans that have dominion over the earth. Um, it means something about how we live in this world. To me, it's important to study Genesis and creation stories because it helps me understand what it was like to be a human back then. What it was like to live in a world where you didn't just know things because you came into a world where there's the internet and people with volumes of knowledge. It's like if you were put into a world without those things, how would you make sense of it? And what I find super fascinating is that cultures around the world, not just Christianity, came up with creation stories. It's something that is shared across all people, is that we want to make sense of why we're here, what we're meant to do, and as Betsy mentioned, the creation story in Genesis is a great way to, um, to look at the bigger picture, not focusing so much maybe on the details, but to understand how do humans make sense of, of how they were to live before science existed. Not that science gives us a way to live, but just different ways of understanding the world. Roger, you've it imprinted on me 15 years ago when you said it to a different class of youth that you helped with my understanding in explaining the different questions that science and religion tackle. Would you share that with us? Well, if I understand what you're asking, I was just about to say that I got this from somebody else that science asks the question, <clears throat> how did we get here? Religion asks the question, why are we here? What is our purpose? What are we supposed to do with the life we have? Can you hear that distinction? How did we get here? Science. Is that right? How do we get here? But why are we here? And religion helps us answer the second question. And whereas <clears throat> once upon a time religion also was trying to answer the first question, most of us nowadays understand that uh, religion doesn't try to answer that question tries to answer the question, why are we here? What, what can we do with our lives? Is that to get at what you're saying, Mike? Yes, sir. All right, last question, because we have time constraints here, but uh, these kids uh, are on the road to college. So what would you like the takeaway from this class to be? For when they go out into the world. Well, college is a great time to learn, um, to learn about who you are, about what the world is. Um, but if more information were the key to happiness, we would be living in um, complete harmony with abundance for everyone. Um, more information is not always is not the way to. It's important, um, but don't let all the things you learn in college um, make you think that it's more important or supersedes the need for a reason, a why, about why we're here. And remember that while you're there. Find your why, and it's not in, in you know, just acquiring knowledge. When I don't think that um, going to college and being in classes all day um, you don't have to take a religion class to keep your faith. Um, so that's, and it, if we've made you think that, then that's um, not right. Because um, I hope that uh, you'll learn some things and then think, oh my gosh, I remember that Sunday school class and we talked about this and oh, maybe that's what was happening there. Um, that these things are meant to talk to each other. It's not an either or. Um, so you're going to learn a lot of cool stuff and I hope it opens up faith for you and um, 
pick up the Bible and open it up and, and see what it might say about um, or questions that it raises about stuff you're doing in your other classes. Because um, I think it's, faith is all encompassing and it's big enough for your questions. So don't stop asking them. Well, maybe not your freshman year, but a little later on, if you get a chance to take a course that's called something like religion and science or um, the history of science, something like that, even if you're not a science major, I think it can really help you make sense of the world and your place in it. You guys are great. Let's thank, uh, Betsy had to go because she has to preach at 11, but let's thank Andrew and Roger for being here today. All right, we're done. Lots of good luck. Get some on the way out if you want it.